from last resort all the way back to the beginning. African Americans are prone to obesity and to obesity related complications like diabetes, hypertension and stroke. Why is that? Is it genetics or is it man-made? Can we blame the past for the present? Mississippi's past is one filled with anger, hate, and violence. For many living outside of the state, the civil rights movement is what defines us, and the issues of the past still hang around in politics, in day-to-day -day life, and in health. Many African American leaders believe the health policy of the past is to blame for the large numbers of obese African Americans today. Dr. Robert Smith is a living legend in Mississippi's civil rights history. One of the only black doctors in the state at the time, his stories will blow your mind. We spent a day with him in April at historic Tougaloo College. I sang in the, in the choir, Tougaloo Choir, for a minute, but uh, that was one of the things that led me to go into medicine. Uh, <laughs> Tougaloo, home for many of the civil rights activities taking place in the 60s. Dr. Smith traces poor health among Mississippi blacks all the way back to slavery. We, from slavery, uh, have a diet has been high in fat, uh, salt, and cured uh, meats, and, uh, and simple carbohydrates. That was, that was the diet of our ancestors. Uh, doing early on, uh, particularly in Mississippi, uh, there were, because of poverty, uh, we had the highest number of people who were affected by uh, malnutrition uh, that was complicated by environmental conditions like worm infectations and other environmental problems. Uh, then through the 60s, uh, we argued for food supplements and those food supplements came in the form of cured meats and cured uh, canned goods and simple carbohydrates again. And then finally, uh, the, we got uh, the government to decide the level of poverty and came food stamps. And then the, you have the uh, problem of custom. I grew up in an environment where I thought white people ate all they wanted to, <laughs> and so <laughs> after black folks got food stamps, better jobs, better opportunities, uh, we just started eating more, uh, not knowing uh, that uh, too much food is just as bad or perhaps worse uh, than too little food. Couple that mentality with an incredible amount of poverty. When I came back here, the average income was $2,000. Uh, with uh, the most, impo most important job for a black female was a maid making $15 a week. Average income in the Delta was a thousand uh, with no access to health care. Dr. Aaron Shirley is a pediatrician and also a huge civil rights leader in Mississippi. Together with Dr. Smith and others, they helped establish the first community health center one that still exists today, providing quality health care to poor Mississippians. Dr. Shirley strongly remembers how different his pediatric patients were in the 60s from what they are like now. I saw many male nurse, black kids, but I didn't see any fat kids. Uh, the kids who were healthy and skinny, uh, the mom, a, care a caregiver cooked meals. And what they cooked was healthier in terms of fresh veggies, which many grew themselves, the fruits, which many grew in themselves, and the availability of fast food, bad stuff, wasn't as prevalent as it is now. And uh, exercise was, was something that 
the, 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 everybody participated in. The moms played ball with the kids. It was a family type of thing. And we didn't have televisions and ghettos and couch potatoes and those kinds of uh, uh, distractions. So when it wasn't raining and you weren't doing chores, kids in those days were outside playing. Malnourishment and hunger also played a role in how people perceived weight as well. If you were carrying extra weight, that must mean you're successful. That mentality still exists in some parts of the black community today. Well, there was a time when a chubby kid, because we had so much malnutrition, a chubby kid was considered as fat and fine and healthy. And over time, it kind of, in, in some, in some uh, groups, over time, it became the norm, you know, if you can to do, like, like uh, I have deliberately uh, uh, lost weight in the last two years. And I have people that I grew up with, they say, hey, we're worried about you, you know? And then last time I was, uh, I was at the doctor looking at me, and I say, hey, you, you are on borderline. Your BMR is 27. <laughs> Dr. Pat Moraine is the granddaughter of one of the first black medical leaders in the state, T.J. Huddleston. Huddleston was responsible for building the first health care facilities for blacks in the state. According to Moraine, prior to her grandfather, Mississippi African Americans were on their own when it came to health. Health care was, uh, it was almost nothing. It was almost, there was no health care for blacks. There were some doctors who had offices, but of course they had no place to, um, to, to perform any surgeries. They didn't have hospitals and hospital facilities to perform services, and blacks could not go to regular hospitals. So you had a lot of deaths a lot of deaths. There was no recourse if you had pneumonia. There was no recourse if you got influenza or typhoid fever or smallpox, which were some of the diseases that were going on during that time. So um, if there was a difficult pregnancy, then there was no doctor to come to, to uh, actually birth that baby. Moraine says her grandfather worked hard to come up with a solution to help blacks get access to health care. Huddleston created a fraternal organization that in essence was an insurance company. People paid monthly dues, and those dues went to build the Sons and Daughters Hospital in Yazoo City. There, black Mississippians were able to see doctors, have medical procedures, and learn proper health guidelines. Dr. Moraine says her grandfather's methods should be a model for today. It's time for us to pick up and solve the problems, and I think that we can come together to do it. Community-based health care can solve the problems of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. All we need to do is to learn better and to understand that we are going to, I among everybody else, we are going to have to be active. If we're not on the farm, we're going to have to be active other ways in order to help our bodies to maintain the kind of health and strength that we need in order to survive. Survival is the key. It was the key in 1924, and it's the key in 2011. Both Dr. Shirley and Dr. Smith agree with Moraine, believing that the solution depends on everyone taking part, and that education should be at the top of the list. I just know that uh, the community is going to have to take some responsibility for starting uh, in school, in preschool, like English, is, your health is certainly as important as math and English. And I think, we again, we ought to have uh, health education from K through 12. Uh, we got to look at uh, what's supplied in terms of uh, uh, the government. We got to look at uh, school lunches. Uh, we just simply got to uh, 
change our dietary habits uh, from uh, the old high fat, uh, high sodium preserved type foods to more fresh fruits and vegetables. And uh, that's going to be a, that's going to be a cultural societal change. Despite the continuing problems, Dr. Smith says things are better and they can get even better. I'm just happy that we've lived to see the change that we have had in this state. Yeah. Huh? And, and we got a lot of work to do. We got, we got tons of work to do. A lot of work to be done indeed. Mississippi is making some very important first steps in changing its health future, but a lot more must be done. None of it will happen without the involvement of every single willing Mississippian. Think of your children, your grandchildren, and decide what kind of future you want them to have and get involved now. That leads us to this episode's homework assignment. We had such a great response from the last round, we decided to make it even harder this time. Number one, start eating off your own portion plate. You can buy one online, or you can just use a normal salad plate you probably already have in your cabinet. Remember, divide your plate into half and divide one of those halves into half again. That should leave you with a half plate and two-fourths of a plate. On the big half, goes leafy green veggies. On one of the fourths goes three ounces of lean meat, and on that last fourth goes a carbohydrate or starch. Plenty simple, huh? Number two on your assignment list, start exercising. It doesn't have to be a boot camp-like program. Just keep it simple. Maybe a daily walk around your neighborhood, or take the stairs at work instead of the elevator you normally use. Whatever you do, as long as it's more than you've been doing, it will make a difference. And number three on the list, learn the nutrition basics. There are plenty of books laying around on the subject, as well as a wealth of internet resources. And finally, the one thing you must absolutely prepare for, the third installment of Southern Remedy, Mississippi's Big Problem. That goes without saying, right? Look for our next episode in August. And finally, check out our website www.mpbonline.org slash Southern Remedy. We'll have more information on our website as well as plenty of links from tonight's show. Of course, you can always email us at southernremedy at mpbonline.org. Let us know what you think about the show and how your homework assignments are going by logging on to mpbonline.org. We have a slew of experts waiting to take your questions. And as always, thank you so much for watching and for your involvement. Our past proves that we can do what it takes to make our future better. We all just have to take part. I'm Dr. Rick DeShazo. Mississippi's Big Problem, a Southern Remedy special, is funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center.